out your phones though or Bibles uh, because we're going to be looking at uh, Luke chapter 5 this morning um, as we uh, continue kind of in our next step series. Uh, recently we did four weeks uh, in the next step series and watched videos of uh, testimonies, stories of people uh, who uh, took some decisions and made some steps forward in their lives uh, in following Jesus. Uh, and as a result of that series, we put a call out to invite our church family to think through and take action on what their next step might be. Uh, and as a result, we saw last week we had seven people baptised uh, and another four or five who are taking that step in the next few weeks as well. Um, we also have 16 people who are wanting to take the step into membership as well, uh, which basically is a is signal from people that they want to be on board with who we are and what we're on about as a church. Uh, that's exciting. God is doing something amongst us and calling us to be taking these steps. And it's part of what it means to follow Jesus. We don't follow anything without kind of moving. Uh, and so we are called to move forward, to take steps, no matter how long we have been a Christian, whether it's for five minutes or 50 years, we are called to move forward. We are called to grow. And in fact, the word disciple literally means uh, a learner, a follower. Uh, and so if you are a disciple of Jesus and you have been so for 50, 60, 70 years, guess what? You have just as far to move forward as you did back then. You're called to continue to grow. And that's true both individually and corporately. Uh, we are also called as a church to follow Jesus and to be obedient in the steps he is calling us to take. So I wanted to take some time today to pose the question, what are the next steps God is calling us to take as a church? Now, as a leadership, we're thinking that through. That's part of our role and part of why we asked you all to fill in recently that chat survey. And just a, a final reminder, that's going to be lodged this Tuesday. So if you haven't yet done our chat survey, the details are in your bulletin or in your email that came out. Uh, we would love to hear from you. But that's a, a way to get an accurate sense of who we are, our passion and sense of calling as a church and our readiness uh, to go where God is calling us. Um, but where we go into the future is not just a leadership decision. It's something that we all need to be seeking God and listening to His Spirit so that wherever He is calling us, we're ready to go together. Now, that process will take probably several months before we really get a clear picture of what that looks like. But I wanted to take today to just plant some seeds uh, and share some things that I feel God is placing before us, uh, not only as a church, but as a region on the Central Coast, and to get us to begin the process of prayerfully considering what it is that God is calling us to, and to sense whether He is stirring our hearts towards a common cause. Uh, as many of you would know, about 18 months ago, I took on the role of Regional Minister for the Coast Churches Network. Uh, which is the network of Baptist churches on the coast. Uh, it, it sounds kind of more important than it is, it, or more impressive than it is. It, it, all it means is that part of my week is spent cultivating a sense of partnership and collaboration amongst the Baptist churches on the coast. Uh, and as part of the Baptist Association, the wider uh, network of Baptist churches, uh, it's my role in a sense to help us churches on the coast to uh, be, play our part in the, the broader vision of uh, the Baptist Association in New South Wales. Uh, and that is called, uh, at the moment, the Gen 1K vision, which is the goal of 1,000, or that we would be a movement of 1,000 healthy churches within a generation. Uh, basically, the premise, the principle behind that is that more and more local communities of Christ followers would be embedded within their neighbourhoods sharing the love of Jesus. Basically, this is a mindset that is a shift from uh, the last sort of 40 or 50 years within the... ...in the 1970s and 80s, went through a, a wonderfully American thing, is, and, and that is that bigger is better. Right? We kind of have 
fallen prey in a sense to that throughout uh, the last 50 years is that big is best. It's a very American mindset. And so uh, the, the thought is that the bigger the church is, the more successful and healthy it must be. And what we then do is that if we've got a whole lot of little struggling churches, what's therefore best is to kind of wind those up and consolidate into one church and make it really an epic church, right? The problem is, is that that epic church has to do the work of all of these smaller churches, what they could combine. And so that one church can never accomplish as much as a whole lot of smaller healthy churches could within their neighbourhoods. So we're actually realising within recent sort of around about the last decade in particular how inefficient and unproductive and unfruitful this whole mentality has been that we get bigger, bigger, bigger churches because all it does is kill off smaller churches. What we want to be doing, what really is more effective and has been for thousands of years is that we would be reproducing communities within neighbourhoods that reach out to their friends in their neighbourhoods. So church planting is a huge strategy now in terms of reaching out to our country with the love of Jesus. And in New South Wales and ACT, our goal is to plant 1,000 healthy, or to be a movement of 1,000 healthy churches in a generation by around about 2050. That's around one Baptist church for every 10,000 people across our state. Now, currently... We have, if Shazzy can go back to an earlier slide. It's not working very well. Can you just push, push down? That's a bit weird. There should, be a, there should be a slide before that one. There should be a slide before that. that uh, it's not there. That is bizarre. I might have to start that PowerPoint again. And, but anyway, just wanted to show sort of some stats about where we sit as a movement. There we go. Perfect. All right. As New South Wales, Raj stepped in. He's our hero this morning. Well done, Raj. Look at that. High-fiving each other down the back. Well done. All right, so in the New South Wales and ACT, our goal is to be a movement of 1,000 healthy churches in a generation. Currently, we are around about 350 churches, which means that we are seeking to plant 650 churches within the next 25 years. On the central coast, currently, well, our goal is to reach 40 churches, and we are currently 11, which means that we are seeking to plant over the next 25 years, almost 30 Baptist churches. And that's not because we want Baptist churches to be, you know, there to the exclusion of other denominations. It's just that as Baptists, we can't control or compel other churches, other denominations to plant churches. So we're kind of like, you know, and we kind of feel that one church, one Baptist church per 10,000 population is still plenty of opportunity for other denominations to have other churches. Make sense? Unless that church is 10,000 people, or all of those churches are 10,000 people, there's still plenty of room. But that is the, that is the goal, to see churches planted. Uh, and that is a lot, isn't it? Now, the good news is, is that around about 12 years ago, there was only just over 300 Baptist churches in New South Wales ACT. And on the coast, there were only, five years ago, there was only nine Baptist churches. So we're getting there, slowly but things are in the right direction. But to be honest, when you look at those stats, that is a massive task that will be exceptionally difficult to achieve. How on earth are we going to reach that goal by 2050? Well, I want to look at a familiar passage today that I believe reveals two important postures that we must take if we are to see this goal come to fruition on the Central Coast. Uh, Have a listen Uh, as I read from Luke chapter 5, uh, verses 1 to 11, uh, and see if you can pick up what elements lead towards uh, the miraculous catch of fish that happens that day. It'll be a familiar passage, you'll know uh, the story, I'm sure, but uh, as I read it, have a listen and think through what is it that leads to the miraculous catch of fish that day. 
Luke chapter 5, verse 1. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats, left there by the fishermen, who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them and they came <clears throat> and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything and followed him. So I'd suggest there are two postures in this passage that are critical in seeing the miraculous catch of fish come about that are instructive for us as we think about such a goal. <clears throat> the first is obedience to the call of Christ. Uh, now, it sounds obvious um, and you're probably saying, Phil, that's not rocket science. Uh, but I want you to put yourself in Simon's shoes for a second. He's an expert fisherman, professional guy, who's out there probably pretty much every day except for the Sabbath. He's been out fishing all night and come up with nothing. He's tired, disappointed, deflated. Then Jesus, a religious rabbi, rocks up and tells him to go back out on the water and let down the nets for a catch. Now, firstly, without it being explicitly stated here, it's probably safe to assume that Simon would have found this quite an annoying request. Having already pulled their boats out of the water and cleaning their nets after a long night, he's now supposed to put it all back out there. No tradie is going to find that anything other than annoying. Like if you're a tradie, you've worked hard all day, think about a frustrating day, a day where you spent a lot of time and got nothing done. Anyone had that kind of a day before? You pack all your tools up, you clean the site, you're going, oh, I'm going home. And then the client turns up and says, oh, no, I need this done. And you go, unpack all your tools again and get going. That's, that's not going to make you a happy chappy, right? Simon is probably not a happy chappy with being told by Jesus to head back out there. Secondly, this is not going to go down probably all that well with Simon, thinking, I'm the expert here. I know what I'm doing. This is my trade. Jesus, you're a rabbi. You know about God's word. You know about the law of God. I know about fishing. Get off my turf. Again, a tradie is not going to be all that happy. Say, a plumber, right? Plumber doing, doing the job on the tools, you know, getting it all set up, and then the chippy comes up and says, nah, I'd move that and I'd do this, so I think you should do that. Tradies don't respond well to that either. I mean, hands up, who likes a rookie coming in and telling them how to do the job that they've done for decades? It doesn't go down well. So Simon's, I'm sure, wrestling with this as he hears Jesus telling him. And then lastly, from Simon's perspective, surely it is doomed to fail, Jesus' request. They had been out there all night and caught nothing. And Simon is probably thinking, Jesus, this lake is overfished. It is empty. We've tried it before and it didn't work. Why on earth would it work now? So we get this picture that Simon was a cynic. He goes, we've been out there. We've worked hard all night. And we've caught nothing. 
Fortunately, although Simon was a cynic, he was also an obedient cynic. And so he says, but because you say so, I'll do it. He had many reasons to tell Jesus to go and find a more gullible fisherman, but he listened and obeyed and ended the day with an extraordinary catch of fish because of that simple obedience. But we also see another important posture in this passage, and that is a willingness to work together. In verses 6 and 7, it tells us that after obeying Jesus and taking their nets back, uh, taking the boats back out again, it says they catch such a large number of fish that their nets begin to break. And Simon, recognizing that he can't do this on his own and that he's about to lose this massive potential catch of fish, he calls out to James and John, his partners in the other boat, to come and help him. And so they come across, help Simon lift his net full of fish into the boat. Then it appears Simon must have repaid the favour, helped James and John do the same with their net because both boats end up so full of fish that they begin to sink. So we see that obedience to Jesus and a willingness to work together resulted in the miraculous catch of fish that day. But I wonder, what would the result have been if either of those postures weren't adopted? Imagine if Simon decided not to listen to Jesus and didn't respond in obedience. Maybe he says to Jesus, I can't be bothered. You know, I've just pulled my boat up on shore. It's all too much effort to put it all out again, put the nets down after we've washed them. Or maybe his cynicism wins out and tells Jesus that this whole thing, it's failed before, so it's not going to work out now. You go and find some other fisherman. Would the miraculous catch of fish happen? Well, maybe Jesus would have found another fisherman, but Simon would have missed out, wouldn't he? Probably go home with a bit of regret, seeing someone else pull in the fish. Or imagine if Simon said yes to Jesus... You know, that he, he didn't ignore or reject Jesus' request. He actually said, okay, yes, Jesus, I'll do what you say. But when his nets got so filled up, he was too stubborn or too proud to ask for help from his partners. Maybe he thinks to himself, nah, Jesus told me to put my nets out and this is my catch. I don't need help from anybody else. If they come in, they're probably just going to steal the glory anyway and came, claim half of themselves or, or something like that. This is, I put the work in, I'm the one who was obedient, I've done, this is my catch. I'm not going to call for help. What do you reckon would have happened? Well, the nets would have torn, they would have toppled over and lost the catch of fish. Or imagine if it was the other way around. What if Simon asked for help but James and John said, nah. Imagine they said, whoa, we've been out there all night too. No fish out there. All of a sudden, there's heaps. Stuff, Simon. We're getting our own boat out there and putting our own nets down there because this is, this is make, let's make hay while the sun shines. Do you think that attitude would have resulted in the catch of fish that day? Would that miraculous catch of fish happen if either of those two postures weren't adopted. See, Simon needed the trust and obedience to do what Jesus asked despite his cynicism. And Simon, James and John needed the humility, generosity and selflessness to acknowledge that none of them could do it on their own, so needed to work together. Now, this miracle, of course, was a metaphor a living illustration that Jesus was using to get Simon, James and John to shift their focus from fishing for fish to fishing for people. The central purpose of this miracle was to show the heart and intention of Jesus to see people caught up in his love and grace, to see many people drawn to him. 
and that he is calling his followers to be partners with him and with each other in seeing that come to fruition. And so the question I want to pose to us as a church today is, will we be responsive to the call of Christ? You see, I believe Jesus is at work here on the Central Coast in some pretty remarkable ways that I'm keen to share with you as time goes on and he's providing opportunities for us to get our boats out there and see an extraordinary number of lives drawn to him. Uh, I mentioned this at a church meeting a couple of months ago uh, but there are opportunities that are arising uh, for possible church plants in suburbs just nearby, potentially out of Oka Beach and Mangrove Mountain. Now, usually when it comes to church planting, what happens, and the reason why church planting is such a slow, arduous, costly process, is that a couple of people feel the call of God maybe to do it. They get their church to pray, they try and rally supporters and people to be involved, try and sort out finances... Then they look around and try and find a place that they can plant a church. They might have a suburb in mind, but then they look around that suburb and say, where on earth are we going to actually start this church? And because property is so expensive and limited, they often can't find anything ideal and so they end up in a garage or a living room or maybe a pub or cafe at best and there are so many limitations in that. But it's interesting that these two opportunities at Avoca Beach and Mangrove Mountain are actual church buildings in locations surrounded by homes and schools and lives of thousands of people who don't know Jesus. And if those buildings are not continued to be used as churches, they will end up being sold off to rich developers to turn into townhouses to make them a lot of money. So these properties are primed for congregations to be there, active and reaching out to their neighbourhoods with the love of Jesus. So in some ways, I can see that Jesus is doing his work and he's calling us to be responsive. Now those conversations are ongoing and these opportunities specifically may not eventuate. They're they're still uh, in, in conversations and God will lead that process. So they're not guaranteed. But to me, it seems like Jesus is doing his work. He's bringing fish to the surface. And I don't want us to miss out on the opportunity because we were busy with washing our nets and cleaning our own boat. Does that make sense? Because that's a reality for a lot of churches is that we get into a mindset of saying let's make sure our boat is really really sparkling you know let's make sure we have all of the facilities on our church let's make sure that we have every person who sits in our boat um you know well catered for you know that they've got exactly what they need and what they want to to be the 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 worshiping community that they want to be And so we get preoccupied with our boat on the shore and washing down our nets going, well, we've used the nets, but, you know, we're we're putting that in recess at the moment and giving them a wash down and we'll just start to chill out and relax and enjoy. But Jesus is doing his work amongst the lives of our neighbours. He's doing his work in raising up opportunities and his call now to a church like us is to say, send your boats back out and throw your nets down because there are people who are ready to come to be caught up in my love and grace. I want us to be ready to say yes when Jesus calls us to put out our boats and let out our nets for a catch. And I want us to be willing to partner with one another and with other churches, if it means that, to see a great number of people be caught up in the message of hope through Jesus. That's part of my role as regional minister is to get us all thinking about how we can work together and help one another out in the commission Christ has given us. You see, Jesus eagerly desires people to be caught up in his love and grace. And I don't think he's much impressed with churches 
who heave their boats up on shore and have cleaned their nets and have put it into recess. His main agenda for a church is to be sending out the boats and letting down the nets for a catch. Will we be responsive when the time comes? Will we respond with tiredness or with obedience? Will we respond with distraction or determination? With cynicism or courage? Will we be willing to work together, to to be bold, to take adventures and risks? Will we support one another and each play our part, whether big or small, to see these or other opportunities come to fruition? See, as a church, I believe we're ready to do something like this. Um, We have a great group of people in our morning and night congregations who are mature, who have Jesus at the centre of who they are, and Jesus is calling us and equipping us to look beyond ourselves, to not look just within our boat and to make sure that we're all doing well, but to say the heart of Jesus is for the fish out there that they would be drawn to him to experience his love and grace. Yes? So are we responsive? Not just individually, when you go out and speak with your own neighbour or co-worker or family, that, that's, that's part and parcel of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. But are we as a church going to be responsive? Are we going to say, yes, Jesus, because you tell us, because you call us, we will send out our boat and let down our nets? Even if that is, uh, even if we are tired, even if it is a risk, even if we... We think we should just keep going as is. But when Jesus calls, will we be ready? So I'd like to invite you to think through what is your part in that? What is God laying on your heart? What part is he calling you to play in us as a church getting ready to launch our boat and throw down the nets? I don't know exactly what that is going to look like but I'm confident in the next few months we are going to be getting some very concrete opportunities placed before us by God to respond. Do we have the courage for it? What is your role in that? Is yours prayer right from now to be upholding this before God and saying, Lord, give us the wisdom. Lord, pave the way lead us in the direction that you want us and may we be listening to that call can you be praying please that god would be working continuing his work towards leading these things to happen perhaps your role is actually being part of it would you be willing to be a part of a group who actually gets in the boat and goes out and lets down the nets for a catch Are you somebody who says, yeah, actually, because Jesus calls me and this opportunity is here, I'm going to take it. It'd be nice to be just remain comfortable in the boat on shore, but maybe God's calling you to go. Or is it financial help? Maybe you're not actually going to be in the boat casting out the net, but maybe you can actually be a backer and say, yep, I'm I'm going to put my money where my heart is. Or maybe practical help. There'll be opportunities, I'm sure, to roll up the sleeves and get involved. So these opportunities are not quite there yet. There's still a way to go before there's any sense of Jesus saying, yep, okay, go. But I believe that part of our response is to get ready, is to make sure that when that call comes, we can actually respond with obedience and remember this partnership between Simon or between Jesus Simon James and John that day led to an overwhelmingly large catch of fish so large that it was like nothing these experienced fishermen had ever seen before 
they were astonished. I have a sense that Jesus is at work. He's bringing fish to the surface all around us on the coast. And I've just shared two stories this morning. There are multiple more where God is clearly at work that we cannot deny that He is doing His part and He's calling us to play our part in response to partner with Him. And if we respond with courage and obedience, I believe we'll be astonished too at the large number of people who come to hope and life in His name. So I lay it out there before you. What is our next step as a church? What is your part in that? May we be faithful in responding to His call. Let's pray.